um, the class is set up so that part one is where are we coming from and part two is where are we going and part three is how are we going to get there and then part four is um, this idea of members and partners and questions and expectations so it's kind of just a way to kind of have that fourth part be a, an opportunity if we haven't covered all things we, we will by then so um, to that end, the, the, the first part of this, of this study is, is centered around the idea of what is, or the question I mean to say, what is praise and worship? And, you know, praise and worship, of course, is a, is a church. It is, a, it, is a, um, it is an incorporation in the state of Missouri. We'll talk about it was a corporation in the state of Missouri. We'll talk about that. But more importantly than all of those things, we call ourselves a Christ-centered disciple-making community. Um, that that language was adopted very early on in our church's history, and it's very precisely chosen language. It reflects um, a very important part about our identity as a congregation, and also about um, where we want to go, and you know what we want to be about, and all of those things. It also reflects our heritage. Um, which is something we talk about a little bit too, because um, you know we are, you know, we are a Lutheran church. But a lot of people, especially in the year 2020, and especially in Southwest Missouri, don't necessarily know what that means in particular. They might know that it's another name, like they might see Baptist Church or Assemblies of God Church or Methodist Church or Presbyterian Church. They just know it's another one of those, but they don't know what the distinctions are, and so. Right off the bat, Christ-centered disciple-making community communicates the most important distinctions that we would have. And of course, any church might say, well, hey, we're, we're those same things too. But we, we want to study that a little bit in more detail because there are some very key points to how this plays out in, in our context. So um, our, our first question, you know, when we say Christ-centered disciple-making community is to say, well, what does Christ-centered mean? Because that's where this really begins what is what is christ centered and so we begin with the word christ and and christ is the greek word for messiah and um you know it's something that you know we we don't necessarily define enough i think sometimes I, i've heard people say well christ is just jesus's last name and uh and you know um that, that's kind of a, a joke but in reality that's his title he is the messiah that's he is, but we refer to him as Messiah. We refer to him as Christ, um, and so it. In Messiah means anointed one, the chosen one, the one who was to come to save us, to save all humanity. And so, um, when we say we are Christ-centered, I want to read a scripture tonight, and the scripture comes from Titus chapter three, verses four through eight. So um, I'm going to put it on the screen here. I just realized I didn't open my Bible up, so let me get it here. And I'll put that on the screen. And um, if I can make this happen, so many screens with Zoom, so this is good. Okay, so uh, let me straighten this up just a little bit. And we're gonna go to Titus chapter three, verse four. And we bring up this, we bring up this passage because it really highlights what Christ-centered means. Like it, it's a, it's a, there's many places in scripture where we could point to, this is just one, but it's a very powerful and, and explicit statement. He says there, the apostle Paul writing to his friend Titus, who was a pastor in training. So Paul carried by the spirit says, but when the goodness and the loving kindness of God, our savior appeared, he saved us. And this is very, very important to begin with um, is that it's he saved us. We did not save ourselves. And, and I just, we always want to kind of really make that a, a focused thing uh, in our congregation. This is, this is one of our distinctions. Um, so he saved us. And how did he save us? Not because of works done by us in righteousness. In other words, um, he had, it had nothing to do with us. Like Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine would say, it's not from us. It's not because of works done by us in righteousness, but it's according to his own mercy. Now, this is, this is a very, very key passage because um, it's, it's according to his mercy. So it's something that he wants to do out of his heart. He is doing that because of his, his mercy. And of course, we always love to define mercy is mercy is um, not receiving what we deserve. So as humans, we all deserve eternal you know, punishment. 
But because of God's mercy, he worked to prevent that. And how did he do it? Well, it's interesting. The first thing it says is he did it by the washing of regeneration. And um, this is kind of interesting because the washing of regeneration there is a is a just a restatement of the word baptism. And so he 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 saved us by the washing of regeneration and and then and then it's renewal of the Holy Spirit. So so in both of those cases, it's what he has done it's what he is doing. And then how did he how did we get the Holy Spirit? Well, he poured him out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And um, and this this kind of just kind of demonstrates his just powerful, powerful working. And why did he do all of this? You know, what is the what is the the so that, you know, in, in, in Greek, there's always this sort of equal sign at the end of Paul's sentences. And it's it's the Greek word henna. And it's always the, 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 the reason the reason he did this is so that being justified by his grace, there's so much denseness in this sentence. But being justified by his grace, we might become heirs. And that's a key, key word there. We might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Heirs means we are actually, in, we're going to inherit the kingdom of God. We're going to be co-heirs with Jesus himself. And, and it's, what are we going to inherit? We're going to inherit certainly eternal life, but all that that brings with us. And there's a lot in the scriptures that... Um, that that talks about. So that's a hyperlink that we'll talk about more a little bit later. And then, then verse eight is this key powerful thing that is why do we, why are we centered upon this? Like, why is that? Why are you know, Mark, you guys just never stop talking about these things. Well, the reason is, is because of verse eight, the saying is trustworthy. And I want you to insist on these things. It's, it's very, it's, you know, it's very kind of, a, I want you to insist um, on these things. And, you know, if you do a little word study there, it's a really big Greek word there. Um, but it, it's this idea that like, this is your center. This is what you, this is like, everything else is secondary. This is primary. Um, and you do that. And here again, he's got another so that um, it's, it's very important to see so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to God's works, to, excuse me, to good works, which is the same as God's works. So the idea there is you do all of these things for the purpose that that's how we'll do God work, God good's work, God's work, which are good works. Can't spit that out tonight. So, so we bring all that up, and I just want to say this is that is that the this the reason well our theology. This is why we do what we do. The way we do it is we do not like. For example, there sometimes you'll go to a church and they'll say, you know, um, you need to be a good person, and and then we would all agree. Well. Certainly we do, but where is the power to do it? And the power to do it is through what God has already done for us. And, and if we, what he says is if we stress these things, what Paul says there in Titus 3, is if we stress these things, we insist on these things, he will then um, be careful. He will then give us the power to, so that we can be careful to devote ourselves to good works um, because we'll be secure in who we are. We'll know that we're free. Does that make sense to, guy, to you guys? Yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, that that's that's kind of a really big, you know, important thing there is just to kind of see that. Um, and, you know, it's like it actually, believe it or not, it permeates almost everything we do. And it almost to the point like Gary and Mickey both serve on the leadership team. And I'm sure they've had a number of times when when they may have thought, oh, my goodness, Mark's really just like spending too much time on this. But it's like it permeates every aspect of our thought. Hi, Kathy. Hi, sorry, I fell asleep. Hey. No, no, you're good. It's Sunday afternoon. That's what we do. We fall asleep. So, Hi, Larry. Yeah, I'm really out of my own. Sunday afternoon is always nap time for me. So this is yeah. very good. <laughs> so we were, just, Kathy, we were just talking about Titus chapter three and, and why we call, why praise and worship is called a Christ-centered disciple-making community. And, and, and we were just highlighting that we get this idea from Titus three, among other places, but it's a very clearly stated one. Um, that says, Paul says, I want you to stress this idea of grace and mercy and, and all of it because of what Jesus has done. Um, so it's, it's um, Titus chapter three, verses four through eight. Now, that takes us to the next question or the next statement, which is disciple making. So Christ centered and then disciple making. 
And of course, you know, the most famous passage is Matthew 28. So I will, I'll put that on my screen as well and share that out to you guys. And so I'm going to go to Matthew 28, verse 16 to 20. And this is the famous thing called the Great Commission. It happened right after Jesus rose from the dead. Some way we say right after, but sometime shortly thereafter. Matthew doesn't really give a timeline for this specific moment, but um, it's when it's when the disciples went to Galilee and they went to the mountain Jesus said he would meet him at. And then I, I love this. It says when they saw him, they worshipped him, but then some doubted, you know. And it's like, wow, you know, it's it's. Can you imagine looking at the risen Christ and still doubting? And I think it's because it would be like a too good to be true thing. I mean, we would just be like, you know, you got to pinch yourself to see, is this true? Can it be true? Maybe I'm hallucinating. You know, what, what is happening here? And then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then, you know, I, I always tell people it's at this point that I would expect him to kind of just flex a little bit. And then like all the powers of darkness would fall down and, and then he would just inaugurate the new heavens and the new earth right then and there. Um, but that isn't what he did. And, and that's a bit of a mystery to Mark Hunsaker for certain. Um, and, but I mean, the scripture does answer us why. It's because he wanted all people, not just the 12, not just some of the disciples, the 11 disciples here. Um, he wanted all people to know him and to, and, to, and to believe in Jesus. And by having that knowledge, you know, come to a knowledge of the truth and be saved. So he says, I want you to therefore go. And it's, it's, um, it's a, it's a, you know, there's this, there's this strong en emphasis on, on us participating here, go therefore and make disciples. And this make disciples is an imperative. It's an imperative. Um, it's the Greek word methe tuo, and you know, from you know, methe, you know, it's like this idea of making disciples, and um, it's it's this participle, which means continuously keep doing it, and it's an imperative one. Um, I say participle, it's an it's an imperative. I just said that, but my brain is a little tired on Sunday evening. But it's this idea we we need to do it. It's it's his call to do it. It's call to us to do it. And so the the participles over here with the word go. Anyway, so make disciples of, of who? Where do we go do it? Do we do only, you know, certain people? No, we do all nations, um, which given our time of racial, racial, you know, stress and difficulties and sort of social unrest, um, it's good to hear this again, is that God doesn't ever, he doesn't treat any certain people group above another. A lot of people get confused about that. We'll talk about that in a later session. But just know that it's for all nations. And um, how do we do this? We baptize people. So um, at the front of our, of, our, of our church building here, we have a baptismal font. And we'll talk more about that next time. But the idea is, is, is it's, it's a, one of our primary functions as a congregation in making disciples is to baptize and so we always love to say, you know, they're like, well, do you only sprinkle? People will say, do you only sprinkle? I'm like, hey, we'll use as much water as you'll let us. So if we can do a full immersion, I'm all about it. I love it. We'll go down to the lake. We'll go down to Table Rock and we'll have to make a beautiful day out of it. So the idea is baptizing however much water is used. It's God's promise. We'll see that in, in the weeks to come. And then there's this business of the name, right? Baptize them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So this is when we get God's name put onto us. And this is very, very important um, because in that way, you know, yeah, I mean, I might look here and say, hey, there's Lair and there's Mickey and there's Gary and there's Kathy. And that's true, but it's really like Lair, son of God and Mickey, daughter of God and Gary, son of God, and Kathy, daughter of God. And, and I think that's language we don't use enough in the church. We got to keep working on that. But it's this idea, you guys have his name now. You're part of his family. Um, it's, we always love to use the example is if you were to get um, pulled over in a town where your dad was the mayor and the police officer walks up and goes, oh, it's you, you know, then he just has to leave. And this is exactly what's going on in our world is the devil pulls us over and he walks up to you and he goes, oh, you're one of those. You're one of his. And then he has to leave, you know, and this is, this is what it is because our dad is more than the mayor. He is the most high God. And 
the devil does not like us talking like that. He doesn't want to hear any of that. Um, and this, this is there. This is what we talk about. So, and then lastly, but not leastly, um, is so you baptize them and then you teach them, right? So this teaching is this Greek word didasko, and it's just this all-encompassing education. Um, it's we 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 would talk about proclamation and explanation. We'll talk about that more in the weeks to come. But the idea is we teach every aspect, and what do we do? We teach everyone to observe, which is observe is this Greek word tereo, which means to yes, hear it but also then hold on to it and use it and make it part of your life. Um, everything that he has commanded us. And then he promises us and surely behold, I will be with you to the end of the age. Any questions on that scripture right there? I know that's a scripture we talk about a lot. So sometimes people are like, Mark, can we just go on to a more interesting scripture? But that's kind of like, that's a big one. All right. Well, um, one of the questions we love, to, we love to bring up is, what is a disciple? Now, certainly we can say it's someone who's been baptized. Certainly we can say it's someone who is in the process of learning all of that teaching, which all of us here are. And, um, but a great way to summarize the definition of a disciple is it's someone who trusts the promises of Jesus and seeks to follow him. So notice that there nowhere in that sentence is someone who attends church. This is an interesting, this is an interesting thing we're going to talk about. Um, a church attender is not necessarily a disciple, nor is a disciple necessarily a church attender. I think the two go hand in hand pretty well, as we'll see. But, but you know, in other words, here's, here's what we're highlighting. Jesus did not say, go therefore and make church attenders. Because believe it or not, making a church attender is a very different objective than making a disciple. So an example of this would be, if I want to make a church attender, then, my, then everything we do about church is, to, is designed to get you to come and sit in these comfy chairs that we have, right? Come and sit in the chairs. It's the butt in seat principle, right? So you want to come, you want to come sit in the chairs. And then if you'll sit in the chair, then, you know, you're like a customer, right to our business and and that we've achieved our objective we've we've converted you into a butt sitter you know you're in the chair and you see that's a very different objective than a disciple now th there's it's strange because much of our discipleship happens when people sit in these chairs or as we're online you know in a zoom call or on our facebook live or a or a youtube live something like that um it can be in any of those things but a disciple is is not someone necessarily who attends church a disciple is someone who longs after Jesus, okay? And of course, we're going to see that longing after Jesus means being in a community. This is how he works. He works through the church. But it, 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 it highlights a very important distinction because um, if our goal is to make disciples, then there are certain things that we might do that other people that are just used to church, churchianity, and we'll use that language, which churchianity is trying to make church attenders. Christianity is trying to make Christians who are disciples, right? And so, so an example of what might be a little different is um, we want to make sure and like have the best, most entertaining um, event that money can buy, if you'll allow that language. Now, Kathy plays the piano in, in our worship services, and I'm greatly blessed by her playing. And I would even argue sometimes quite entertained. In other words, I'm enjoying it greatly, right? But, you know, it's, it's like we would talk about this when we were doing some recording back in March and April for our lives or for our, um, our online services. Every once in a while during the recording, she might hit a wrong key or, you know, something might happen. I certainly make mistakes when I'm talking quite frequently. And it was like we were having this conversation. We're like, well, does it need to be perfect? And the answer is no, no, it does not. So we just, us and all of our works, we're just doing this. We're not, we don't pressure our people to make it so good with the great worry that they, if people don't like it, they might not attend. If we're interested in making disciples and people don't want to attend, that's just, up to them and we pray for them and we come alongside them if we can but it just is what it is if you long after jesus he might actually call you to go to another church this is a crazy idea as well we've had a couple come to us one time and say we love praise and worship we absolutely think it's fantastic but what we what we we're feeling called to move to another state and to do mission work there 
You see now a church that wants to have church attenders is going to be sad about that. A church that wants to make disciples is going to jump up and down and go, wow, you want to go and do more mission in another place? Praise God. See, and that's where you start to see some real strong distinctions between us. Any questions or thoughts on, on that distinction? Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, the, uh, I do have a question. D does yep. does this, do this, are, are disciples required to proselytize, to, to go out and, and try to bring others to church? Is that yeah, part of discipleship? Really, it's a really good question, Lair, and I want to be careful how I answer it because, I mean, the short answer might be yes, but you said required. And then you use the word proselytize. And what I would say is that maybe we're getting into a wrong way of thinking in, in using those words. Um, I think the best way to answer it is to look at a scripture verse. So let's, let's do that now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my screen out to my Bible again. And we're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 2. And we'll start in, we'll start in verse uh, 9 here. My bad. I accidentally pushed an ache. Um, and so this is kind of a helpful verse. So it's basically verses nine and 10 in first Peter two, and he's addressing non-Jewish people. He, he highlights that they are Gentiles. Uh, I'm sure there's a few Jews who are reading this letter too, but he is highlighting these, if you these can't hear. Gentile people. And he says, he Would you, says like to hear? you are a chosen race. Okay. You are a chosen race. So this is the first part, and that, oh, that is a hyperlink. <laughs> that is a hyperlink back to Exodus chapter 19. So is this part. I should have underlined all of this. This is all part of that, Exodus 19. So he's now including the Gentiles in this people of God. He says, you're a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That I mean, I just should have hyper. All of that is part of that same hyperlink. He's almost quoting Exodus 19 there. He's doing like a, a paraphrase. Why? What is the so that? So sometimes our, our English Bibles um, don't always um, um, put the so that in there, but it's the, it's, it is so that. And then it says, you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light, into his marvelous light. So I read that scripture and then, and then let's don't, let's not verse, let's not lose verse 10. Once you were a people, we're not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So, so he's, he's got that kind of description in there. But this, this business here in yellow, this is addressing your question, Lair. It's, he's doing this so that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, the thing is, is that not everybody, not everybody among us is a proselytizer. Okay, and what I mean by pro, what I mean by that is not all of us are going to say, "Hey, you need to know Jesus." You know, you come here, come here, listen to me tell you about Jesus. What you might be is someone, and now Blair, I'm picking on you because one day I was at Silver Dollar City when you were doing um, the roller coaster, and 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 the name of it flew out of my mind. Tell me what it was again. Thunderation. Thunderation. Thank you. It would not come in, into my mind. And so you were doing Thunderation and you were doing the, 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 the just announcements of what Thunderation was. You were, everybody was where, to, where they should line up and all this stuff. And you did all this. And, and you never mentioned the name of Jesus. You never, you never said anything about the gospel or anything like that. But what you were doing is you were being you and you were, being, you were going over and above the call of duty. You were sharing your joy in your heart. It was splashing all over all of those people. And I saw all of the people smile. Right. They were all smiling at how much fun you were making, literally waiting in line and getting ready to get on the ride. Yeah. And so what, what, what I thought in my heart is this is Lair doing his vocation. OK, your vocation is your calling and your calling is whatever you're called to do right now. And we all have many of them and they change during our life. Like right now, Lair, your vocation is to be with family. And so you've relocated to be with family. However, at that time, on that day, your vocation was to work at Silver Dollar City and to make that ride a blessing and make that experience a blessing for the, for the visitors to the park to have a great time. And when you do that, when you would do that and you would share that and have that passion and, that, and just literally letting your light shine, that was doing exactly what 
first Peter says, among other verses, I, I'm thinking of Matthew chapter six, seven, and eight, somewhere right in there where Jesus is talking about, let your deeds be a, like a light before men, because they are, they're, you're proclaiming this marvelous light. So, so a disciple is not required to proselytize in the most technical sense, but a disciple is required to let his light shine. Does that, does that make sense? And yes. certainly that will cause conversations to happen as you build relationships. And at some point, somebody's going to say, Lair, why are you, why do you care about all these people? They're just, see, you, this is what the world would say. The world would say, these people are just a bunch of, they don't care. They, they're, they don't, they're not thankful for what you're doing. Why would you waste all your energy on them? And you're like, well, because Jesus loves me and because he set me free and I'm now free to, to love my neighbor. You know, and you see how that kind of thing can start to work. And yes. um, that's yes. where, that's how this kind of plays out. So yeah, it's a great question. Would it, would one of us have to owe Aaron $5 if I bring him up? Um, no, you're only me. You're, you're good. <laughs> okay. Um, but I think what the conversation with Aaron today was a perfect example that, Somebody asked what is at work, what his dad did, you know, oh, he's a pastor. And then these people started to watch the services and then the whole clan of them, they're here from another country at midnight on Sunday nights, watch our service because they miss their church so much. Um, <laughs> it was just an example. I know they're not, you know, taking unbelievers in, but it's sure. It's, anyway, I'll let you. But no, you're 100% right, Kathy, because then through that, God works in so many ways that we can't even begin to understand. And that's going back to this whole business in Matthew 28, where Jesus says, I want you guys to go make disciples. And, and it's he works through us. And he, this is one of the key teachings of our, our faith tradition is God works through means, which includes people. And, and we're going to see water and bread and wine as well. But the idea is this, he works through people, he works through those conversations. And so when we be the true us, the set free us, the, the shining light us, which is exactly what, you know, these examples indicate. Then things like you said, Kathy, they happen. And they, and they're going to be all kinds of things. Sometimes it'll, it is as simple as um, we are, you know, coming out of a store and you, you reach back and hold the door. I know you can't do it in social distancing, but you know, you do something to help someone in the moment and maybe help them help, help their social distancing go easier. I don't know. Um, those kinds of things make a difference in the world. And we just see God working through all of that. So, so yeah. I have, so, to, tell really you, I have to tell you an experience I had. You brought to mind an experience I had uh, when I was working at Thunderation. Uh, th this is something I will never forget. Uh, a woman and a young girl were riding and I was checking restraints. And as I got to that uh, couple, I said to the lady, uh, ma'am, you'll have to remove your hat uh, or you'll lose it. Uh, she said, mm -hmm. oh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, under cancer treatment and, and, and I've lost my hair. Uh, I took my hat off <laughs> and had no hair. <laughs> and I said, hey, God made a few perfect heads and the rest he covered with hair. <laughs> and she laughed and gave me her hat. Later, during the same day, this was a granddaughter who was riding. She rode without her grandmother. And she said to me, as I was checking, checking her restraint, she said, thank you for making my grandma smile. Oh, wow. It, See, it praise God. Day. <laughs> but that's, that's what you're talking about. And I, and, and that's exactly right. See, you know, I want you to think about what Lair, Lair, what you're talking about, because you didn't do anything religious or churchy or anything like that. What you did is you, you just loved people, right? And, and that light of God, that love that is light came out of you and it went into another person. And they actually experienced God through his servant, through, through you. And that actually made them a, more aware of God's presence than they would have been otherwise. You know, and we've all had the alternative to where somebody's like, take your hat off, you know, and then they're just mean and grouchy and you're like, wow, okay, good times at the, you know, wherever. And so, yeah, so it's just a complete flip of, of the broken world. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Point. I, think, I think, Mark, maybe sometimes the uh, kind of the epitome of what you're talking about is 
and it hasn't happened a whole lot of times, but every once in a while throughout my life, someone has said, you know, what is it, ask the question, what is it that makes you so joyful or what is it that mm. makes you so happy or what's behind your optimism or something like that, you know, and that just, and of course that's a, that's a lead in to, to yes. tell them about, tell them about Jesus and the difference Jesus has made in your life. But what that is, I always get a big in, you know, my heart smiles really big when that happens because that says my, my light is shining bright enough that someone, it, it caused someone to ask that question. I wish that exactly. happened every day, but it, it certainly oh, yeah. doesn't. I wish it did, but but when it does, it's something very special. It's really well said, Gary. Really well said, and I think that 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 becomes. And you know, some of us have the gift of of evangelism, of of proselytizing, and you know, so so actually, then that you know, like I've been around some good friends like they just want to go everywhere and talk about Jesus that's what they want to do and and that's a powerful thing but I, I think what you just said Gary is highlighting is we can be talking about Jesus without ever saying his name and then that gives that gives opportunity that will bring questions to when you know if somebody asks you why you have joy in your heart on a regular basis invariably your answer is going to in some way lead in that direction and that's where um, I, I want to show you guys another scripture that kind of highlights this. And it's, it's also in Peter. It's just a chapter beyond there. And it will go to chapter 3, verse 15. And um, Peter is talking about, you know, how to handle life and just, you know, make it through. And he says, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. And so, you know, that's kind of the thing where you're just saying Christ, Jesus is different. Remember, holy means different it's set a, he's set apart it includes good but it's it's much more than that it's a, he's he's unique there's no one like jesus and then he says always being prepared to make a defense for anyone asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you and so so this is saying you know you're 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 being prepared and when and in that in that vein you know that's part of the learning and saying how would i go about telling people about Jesus, especially in a world where people don't really want to listen to that. And then also to make a defense. And, you know, so it's, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing because um, the, the, the make a defense part is, is kind of, you know, it's the Greek word apologia. And it's, it's this, you know, tell, you know, answer to the objections of why people wouldn't believe in God. So that's part of our learning. That's one of the reasons why we still do church and church services and Bible studies and gatherings um, is we're always learning and growing in Christ. And so this, this allows so that if anyone who does ask you, just like you're talking about, um, if they ask you, then you have, for the reason that the hope is in you, then we can do it. But now don't do it like, like Mark did when he was, I don't know, 18 years old or something. Um, and I, you know, people would ask me about Jesus and, 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 or ask to defend my faith. I did not do it with gentleness and respect. I did it with um, rudeness and arrogance. You know, I was, like, I was like, yeah, I'm right, you're wrong, and I'm going to prove everything. And no, no, no. Do it with gentleness and respect. So, so that means, gentleness means I might bring up Jesus, and then that person might like, you know what? I didn't know that was where this was going to go. And I, I give you an example of that. Um, I got onto a plane uh, last November and, um, and a lady sat next to me and she, we got to talk and I said, what do you, what do you, are you business or pleasure on this trip? And she's like, Oh, business, you know, I'm a marketing consultant or something like that. And she said, how about you business or pleasure? And I said, business for me, because I'm going to a leadership conference. And she goes, Oh, cool. What kind of leadership conference? I'm like, well, it's for the church. And she, you know, you could just see all the color kind of went, <laughs> went out of her face. That was not what she wanted to talk about. She's like, Oh, you know? And, and so, so that's where gentleness kicks in. It's not like, you know, um, I one time saw somebody, they talked to her like that. And he's like, you know, what are you just an unbeliever, an atheist, you know, or just start being mean to him. No, you just gentleness. No, it's like, no, it's good. You know, it's, it's exciting. Cause I mean, if people in every industry, people in every kind of uh, activity need to learn and grow. And, and then I think that was kind of something she enjoyed kind of connecting with as well. So, 
So uh, we over the course of the of the flight, we got to talk a little more. But yeah, it was very good. Hey, Barry, how are you? Late. <laughs> no, you're right on time. You you no worries at all. Um, so we were just kind of finishing up a little talk about discipleship and um, a little bit about what the role of sharing our faith is in that. And so uh, good, good conversation about that as well. So we've got just a little bit of time left, which is, is a, a time to tell us a little, tell a little bit about where praise and worship came from. And um, we always love to tell this story because it, it, it's uh, kind of a fun story. And so um Pastor Dar, who is my mentor, and um, he is the founding pastor of Praise and Worship. Um, he, he had moved to Branson as, in a retirement kind of mode, but it was one of those things where for him, retirement meant planting a church. And so I'm like, that's pretty good retirement. Um, and so he kind of worked together with the Missouri District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and um, kind of got rolling with that. And in 2007... <laughs> Uh, in July of 2007, so that's been quite a long, you know, what is that now? We're in 2020, so that's 13 years ago this month. Uh, Praise and Worship had its first gathering, and I don't know that it had a name at that point. It was just kind of the uh, the satellite at the Bart Rocket Theater, and you can't tell that story without telling during the first gathering that during Dar's sermon, they accidentally, they were at the Bart Rocket Theater, and they accidentally turned on the snow machine, so it started snowing during his sermon, um, so you always got to tell that story, and and he was kind of, <laughs> he's like, it's hard to preach when it's snowing inside. And I would agree with that. I've never had it happen to me, but I bet it is. Um, and so he would tell that story. And there's a lot of other stories. And then th during, you know, and shortly after that, they moved to the Golden Corral Dinner Theater here in Branson on Chevrolet Hills Expressway. And at that Golden Corral Theater, that's when Praise and Worship really started rolling. And it's also where they got the name. They would put a sign sort of outside the dinner theater that would say something to the effect of, free praise and worship service. Um, and, the, and the manager there at the Golden Crow was really much helping the church get started because he would provide free coffee and donuts and, um, and he would encourage people. In fact, I think he even helped, helped arrange the sign. I'm not sure. There's, I've heard different things on that. So the idea there is that people then eventually just started calling this group praise and worship. And so that's kind of where the name came from. Um, and then they were there at the Golden Corral um, for several years and then moved to Stonebridge um, for, a, I think, about a year and a half. Don't, wanna, don't quote me on that time. I don't have that in front of me. year and a half to two years. And then to Lynn Weddle Winery in 2013. And it was with that move to Lynn Weddle Winery uh, in 2013 that Praise and Worship organized and became a congregation, which what we call chartered. And the chartering process happened on December the 15th. 2013. So this upcoming December, Praise and Worship will turn seven years old officially, although, um, as we mentioned, um, um, 13 years old, um, if you go all the way back to 2007, uh, to where the first gathering was. So so pretty cool. So not an old church, um, not a young church. Um, we're, we're kind of just going through our first phase. And, and if you were to sneak into a leadership team meeting, one of the things you would see going on now and sort of the course of our congregation is we're transitioning from being a church plant into an established congregation. And that process is a challenging one because we don't really have much structure and, and we're trying to build a little bit, but not too much because we don't want to create structure that, that the church, um, where the people have to serve the structure instead of the other way around. We want the structure to serve the people. So it's a process and, and they're very thankful for all the many hands that are helping make that happen. So on page two of the handout, and if you guys don't have the handout, I'm going to go ahead and put it on the screen, and, um, and we'll do that here. So I'm going to hit share screen, see if I can remember the screen that I should do here, and we'll go to page two. And this is the one where I wanted to highlight a couple quotes here. This is, um, what does Lutheran mean? And we always love to spend a minute for this, because if you look at our sign, which of course we're going to get a sign, we don't have it yet, but if you look at our banner or our logo or any of our handouts, our website, it doesn't come right at you and say, praise and worship Lutheran church. And so why is that and what's going on? Well, we, we mentioned that not everyone here in Southwest Missouri knows what Lutheran is. And so we love to have to answer that question. The word Lutheran does not mean we think Martin Luther was some sort of higher man. Quite the contrary, we call him Uncle Marty. 
He was a normal man, a broken man, and it was through his struggle of asking who is God and what do I think of him that led to his big discovery, which we're going to talk about. But um, if you read Uncle Marty, he'll say things like, love God. I don't, I didn't love God. I hated God because here he did, he was, he created me and then he wanted me to somehow be a good person. And then yet he made it so that I couldn't be a good person. And I mean, you know, Luther was a bit of a, a bit of a genius of theology and he saw through, um, 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 I'm trying to think of, <laughs> he saw through stuff that, that um, sometimes people create, let's just put it that way. And he could see through all of that. And then he would just know that that was a bunch of made up stuff. And so he could just see through the, the trappings of the church and know that that was silly. But then this blue quote that's on screen, he says, at last meditating day and night by the mercy of God, I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that through is that through which the righteous live by a gift of God, namely by faith. Here, I felt as if I were entirely born again and had entered paradise itself through the gates that had been flung open. And he wrote that a little later in his career when they had put together his, his writings as a collection and called the Luther's Latin writings, the complete edition of the Latin writings. And so that, that, um, that whole time period is something we call the Reformation. And um, it's important just to take a minute or so, not many more, not more than that, but a minute or so just to go back in history and just be reminded of how, how we got to where we're at in church history. So if you go back to Jesus, you have, you don't have, there's the idea of denominations doesn't exist. You have the church in Ephesus, you have the church in Corinth, you have the church in Jerusalem. Hang on. You have, you have all of these different things. I think Larry's got a visitor. And, and you have all these different things going on. And, um, um, and you just have churches. And then throughout the time, then the church, just like praise and worship, gets a little more structured. Maybe a little too, too structured by the 4th, 5th centuries. Um, and then you have things called popes, which are these sort of chief bishops and um, they kind of get involved and then there becomes a corruption in that. Now I'm skipping over the great schism for those Bibles or those historical scholars. We'll talk about that a little later, but we're just kind of following the Western church since we're in that. And so you, you see corruption happen in the structure of the church. And by the time of Martin Luther, the corruption was very bad. And even those who still are part of the Roman Catholic church will generally admit that in the 1400s and 1500s, the corruption among the papacy was at an extreme level. And so what happened is, is Luther was going through this process. He'd been nearly struck by lightning. He promised that if God would somehow save him in the lightning strike, he would uh, become a monk. And, and so he survived the lightning strike. And, and so he became a monk, much to the chagrin of his father. And um, he goes to be a monk. And, and the more he learns about God, the more he hates God, and the more he realizes he can never be righteous. And so throughout that whole process, finally, his father confessor, a guy named Staupitz, he's like, you're going to go to Wittenberg, and you're going to teach the New Testament, and you're going to just, you're going to get out of my hair, because I'm tired of you, you just being so focused on the bad. And that's when somewhere along the way, as he began to teach Romans and Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians and other literature, and, you know, and certainly the four gospels within the New Testament, somewhere along the way he, he got faith and then the pope dispatched these guys who were selling indulgences and an indulgence was something you could buy that would get your loved ones out of purgatory now of course purgatory is not in the bible and you know and much of the things that they were doing with indulgences none of that's in the bible i mean it's just kind of all made up sort of system by which you would do that. And the reason the Pope had dispatched these guys was because he needed to have money to build St. Peter's Basilica. Okay, that's, that was the purpose. Well, a guy by the name of John Tetzel comes to the town of Wittenberg. Well, he comes to a nearby town of Wittenberg. He didn't actually go to Wittenberg, but he went to a nearby town and, and Luther caught wind of this. He heard about this guy selling salvation. And he's like, oh man, and by this time, he'd been reading the New Testament. He's like, this is not in the Bible. That's ridiculous. And so he wrote the 95 Theses, which are the famous nailing them on. You know, we always the joke now, the, the meme that goes around now every Reformation Day is Martin Luther nailed it, right? He nailed it, right? He got it. But anyway, so he nailed the 95 Theses on the Wittenberg door. He sent a copy of those to the Pope. 
And he wrote to the Pope thinking the Pope had no idea that John Tetzel and these other indulgence sellers were in town, um, not having any idea Luther had no idea that the Pope had actually dispatched these guys. So that was that was a big mess. And then there was a lot of political controversy. Certainly there was a lot of theological controversy. I'm summarizing hours and hours of information into, into seconds. But needless to say, out of this time period, the Protestant movement of the church began. And it began with not Lutherans, but it began with um, people who were saying, how do we be church? in the face of a corrupt leadership? How do we reform the church? Of course, the church said, I'll tell you how we're gonna reform it. We're gonna kick your butt right out of the church. And they excommunicated many of them, tried to have many of them killed. The only reason Luther survived that early time period was because he had a prince who had an army who had a good relationship with the emperor, or at least somewhat good enough to, the, the emperor owed him a little bit. And so he politically and, 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 and all of the things, the social aspects of it, Luther survived. But after the Reformation got rolling, then other churches sprang up. So you have the Anabaptist movement, which means people were saying Luther didn't go far enough. And you have um, eventually kind of growing out of that, you have um, what we call the reform, it became called the reform movement, which was what led to what we now see as Presbyterian churches and other things like that. So because of those different groups sort of arising during this period of time, Eventually, the name Lutheran was assigned to Uncle Marty's group. And, and so you had these three different groups that would eventually create 300 groups and, you know, on the, on the history goes. And I share all of that with you just to share that, that um, that's why we, we still use the word, because our church follows that tradition all the way back to Uncle Marty. But it's not Uncle Marty we put our faith in. And this is the next part I want to show you. Um, which is the next part of our document. Um, um, and, and this is very cool. I want you to, I want to read you this blue quote that's kind of near the top of my screen now. It says, the first thing I ask is that people should not make use of my name. This is Martin's writing. Uh, this is from his works, volume 45, pages 70 to 71. And that you should not call yourselves Lutherans, but call yourselves Christians. What is Luther? The teaching is not mine, nor was I crucified for anyone. How did I, poor stinking bag of maggots that I am, come to the point where people would call the children of Christ by my evil name? Not so, my dear friends. Let us abolish all party names and call ourselves Christians after him whose teaching we hold. Now, at Praise and Worship, what our goal is, is remember, we're a Christ-centered, disciple-making community. So we're not interested in making church attenders. We're interested in making disciples. It's also noteworthy that we're not interested in making Lutherans, okay? Now, I want to make a distinction there because if, if for, for a, long li a lifelong Lutheran or for someone who, you know, has no reason to, you know, do away with the name or to, to, to distance himself from the name, they're confused when we say that. They're very confused. And I want to just explain real quickly is that, is that the reason we're doing that is we're following Uncle Marty's own advice here. He's like, no, you, know, you need to focus on Christians. Now, there were times a little bit after he wrote this that he would ex sort of accept the name to, to, to just for functionality. But the reason why he resisted that is he wanted our focus to be on Jesus, which I would argue most of my Lutheran friends are very focused on Jesus. There's not the issue. But in our context here in Branson, Missouri, where a lot of people don't have any background with Lutherans. Now, if you're in Grand Rapids, Michigan, or if you're in uh, Blue Earth, Minnesota, or you, you know, you're in one of these places where Lutherans are running around everywhere, I mean, it just makes sense. You would say, hey, we're Lutheran church. You wouldn't even think twice about it. But here in Southwest Missouri, people either think that means we're some sort of Catholic spinoff, or we're maybe like a really liberal church that doesn't believe the Bible anymore because there's another church's name that's Lutheran that, that has rejected the Bible more or less. And so there gets a lot of confusion. So I, at best, all it is is confusing. And at worst, it becomes kind of a party name. It creates disunity rather than unity. We have unity in Jesus. And so that's why we emphasize that. Now, I won't put it on the screen, but if you were to go to Luther's large catechism and you were to go to his teaching on the, on the creed, and you were to go to his third article, he teaches, he goes, you know what, you know what churches should be called? They shouldn't be called churches at all. 
He said they should be called communities because that's what they are. And so what's ironic is, is when we say praise and worship is a Christ-centered disciple-making community, all we're doing is translating Lutheran church into language that someone who knows nothing about any of this would understand. A Christ-centered means we're going to talk about Jesus all the time and, and community, which is a way of saying church to someone to, to, to highlight to them that we're not interested in, in sort of churchianity. We're interested in Christianity. Does all of that make sense to you guys? That, any questions that kind of comes out of that? You know, I think, I love, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, no, I was just going to say, I, I really appreciate that, Mark. That clarifies, clarifies some thoughts that were, had been running around my head in kind of a jumbled manner. And that yes. brings order to it. So that's really good. Excellent. What, Excellent. what I love about what I am observing in this church is the lack of ritual. Uh, I'm not into that. And uh, <laughs> I can appreciate the fact that you were a rebel. You have to have been a rebel <laughs> at seminary because you were not, from what I understand, Lutheran churches to be, you are not a typical Lutheran minister, and that's why I am sticking with you. <laughs> so, Thank you, Larry. We'll talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, Mickey. So, to be a member of uh, Praise and Worship Church, and someone says, "What denomination are you?" I'm I'm in the community of a Christ-centered church. You know, you can say it's a Lutheran church. There's nothing wrong with saying it's a Lutheran church. We don't hide that. We, we, it, it, what we're trying to do when we use this language is to try to clarify that, that we're, we're less interested in coming up with silos about the labels of different Christians, and we're much more interested in the unity that we have around Christ and around his gifts and around his word, which, of course, is one of his gifts. So, so, that, that, so yeah, if somebody says, oh, Mark, quit, quit, quit messing around. What church? Is it? We're a Lutheran church. We are. And, there, and, and if you study my sermons or my theology or our practices here, um, and it's interesting, Lair, you mentioned the rituals. We do have them. that we, we just do them in a slightly different way that are easier for people who didn't grow up this way to, to learn them. Um, but, but, but see, your point, Larry, is made, your point made is, is made, Larry, that, that they are accessible, right? Um, and so when we do the confession absolution, when we do the Lord's Supper, when we do these kinds of things, we do them in a way so that if you haven't heard them before, you can still be a part of them. Right. No, yeah. it, Barry, did you, did you want to chime in on something there? Well, for Larry's benefit, I'm the original rebel. <laughs> Mark went right. to St. Louis. Mark went to Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, where he was at least tolerated. I went to Concordia <laughs> Seminary in Fort Wayne, where uh, I caused more than a few ripples. <laughs> and and, and, it, and it basically, uh, let's see, I've been 35 years. It'd be 35 years next year as a pastor. Uh, every one of my churches is, was was and is at some point very similar to praise and worship. In fact, the one I served long, our church was just called Lord of Life. People would ask, are we Lutheran? I'd say yes. And some people who were very Lutheran said, but it doesn't say it on the sign. And I said, he went out to the sign down the bottom. I know it says Lutheran because I, I scribbled it down there in pencil. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, it, it, you guys bring up a good point. And, and, and this is something that I would just say um, that's, you know, kind of a good good place for us to conclude is that, and this, Mickey, this goes back to your question a little bit more in detail and so forth, is is what what makes a church Lutheran? If there is such a thing as a Lutheran church, what makes it Lutheran? Is, is it the rituals or is it the sign or is it, you know, those kinds of things, these external things, these sort of visual things you can see, or is it the confession? And this is something that's very, very, you know, we'll talk more about in future weeks. But one of the things that all Lutheran pastors do was we take an oath that when we are going to do pastoral ministry, we are going to uphold the word of God as the norm by which all other things are normed, which is to say it's God's truth. 
and the period. I mean, there's just no disputing that that's the word of God. But then the second thing we take an oath to is we say that we are going to believe, teach, and confess the um, the Lord's, excuse me, the book of Concord, because it is a faithful exposition of the scriptures, of the word of God. Now, the book of Concord is a collection of all of the confessions of the time of Martin Luther and others in his lifetime. And a little bit late, you know, he died in, in uh, what was it, 1563. Don't quote me on that, but that sounds about right. And um, right in that time period, he died. And then from then until about 1580, there was this sort of settling in on what do Lutherans teach. And we teach everything in that. In fact, I would argue, and this is interesting, Lair, you talk about being being a rebel. This is what actually really causes the troubles. I would argue that we're more Lutheran than anybody you can find, um, which is to say that we want to highlight the contents of that confession. And we bring them out. And um, anyone who's really familiar with the contents of that, of those confessions, um, they will hear me speak of them quite frequently. Now, for the, for the one who doesn't know anything about that or has never even heard of the Book of Concord, then I'm not going to make it so that they have to know that in order to access Jesus. Does that make sense? In other words, we always want to lead with Jesus. And the confession is this rule of faith, which allows us to, if we hit turbulent water, if we hit you know, things that we don't understand, or we hit some difficult challenges, you know, uh, the culture changes, and we got to navigate all of that. The confession is this way of, of saying, well, it's not just up to what Mark says, it's up to what this, this the church has said all along. And this is where it really gets interesting. Because um, you, you remember that we left um, the Lutheran church, what became the Lutheran church left the Roman church, the Roman Catholic church. We didn't leave it because we wanted to. We left it because they kicked us out. And we're like, you guys are not following the canon law. And the desire always was to go back and reform the original church to say there's just one church. That was always the heart of, of Uncle Marty and all the people of that, of that time period. Now, that didn't, that didn't become possible. It got worse. The, 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 the schism only increased with time. However, what we always say is, is that if, if they were to, to reform to what the rule of faith is, that is to our confession, it sounds a little arrogant at first, but trust, trust, trust me, uh, or stick with me, I should say, if they were to come a little closer to where we're at, we would actually have the opportunity to, to join back with them. And so the reason we say that is we root our church in Jesus and then in all of the church history that has come since then, whether it be in the early church fathers, like um, the time of Eusebius or the time of Irenaeus and, and Chrysostom, or, you know, a little later, in, you know, more like Augustine or, or other guys like that, is that the, the church fathers had these creeds and these councils and these writings. And, and what the Lutherans did is they went into those and they said, are we sticking with those guys? And, and, and they said, yes, we are. And that's why we say we believe teach and confess because it's our way of saying we're sticking with the original church we want to go back to the original and try to continue to be faithful to them and so that's ultimately what i would argue a lutheran church seeks to do is by being christ-centered we're saying we're going to do that within the whole realm of christianity all the way back to the beginning we're not saying we're smarter than others i know that's the way it sounds when we say it that way but that's not what we mean at all we're just saying we're trying to we're trying to honor god in his word and we're using all these tools of history as a measuring stick to see when we get out of whack because we get out of whack sometimes. And, and that's why we're called to reform every generation. So now here's our challenge. I promised we would honor the 7:30 time frame, and we're at 7:33, So we do need to, to conclude, but I want to make sure, are there any little dangling questions that we have um, here tonight? All right. Hey. I guess I guess yeah, I do Gary. have one question, Mark. So please, um, and I ask this question. Probably the, the wording of my question will reflect my ignorance, but stay with me. But I hear you know there are different elements within the Lutheran Church that you know yes. one is much more liberal in their interpretation of this, that, or the other thing. And so, how does that? How do you reconcile that with what you just said? Yeah, no, that's a really, really good question. And the answer is that that book of Concord, um, what you basically have within Lutheranism, if, and I don't like that word, but um, what you have within the Lutheran tradition 
is you have these different groups and some of the groups have openly said, we're just not really going to, we're not going to look at the book of Concord as something that's required. We're just not going to do that. In other words, what they're saying is we're not going to participate in the common confession that you guys share. And so they just essentially detach from that and they go off and do different things. And that's kind of par for the course for all humans, all Christians. We, we have, we struggle with disunity. So, excuse me. So, this, the ones who the ones who do not detach, the ones who stick with the Book of Concord, our group is always seeking to be in fellowship with them. So even if they have a different group and they're just organized under a different name, we're in fellowship with many of those other bodies because um, we're like, hey, we we believe the same things. We're part of the same community. We just are organized a little differently. And so you'll have different what are called synods. These the synod, yeah, the word synod means walking together. So you'll have different organizations, but especially in other countries, there's lots of Lutheran bodies that share the same faith as us. And so even though there are different names, different groups, we walk in fellowship. But for the ones that say, well, we like the Book of Concord, or we might like the Augsburg Confession or different parts of it, but we don't like the formula of Concord, which that's actually kind of a big deal for a lot of Lutherans is they don't like the formula of Concord, which is one of the, one of the confessions in there. And so that's where a big chunk of them detached. And then, you know, the liberal ones, they just have detached from everything. You know, it, it, it's kind of like if you, if, you, if you have this point of view that you say, well, you know, um, I don't believe that the Bible is, is a true historical document. Well, then, then we don't have much to agree on, and that becomes very difficult to stay in fellowship. And so it's not because we want to be disunity, have disunity, but it's because we, we, we form our unity around God's word. So great question. And so, yeah, essentially there's two, two kinds of Lutherans. There's the ones that hold on to the book of Concord as their way of saying, this is, this is our anchor to history. And it's our, you know, and, and, and even though there's, there's some dis this disagreement among that, there's a lot of discussion and dispute, you know, but it's healthy, you know, it's iron sharpening iron and within that group. Um, but those who just say, nah, you know, then that's just a matter of time. And we've seen it historically. If they throw out the book of Concord, then eventually they'll throw out the Bible or some parts of it. Yeah. So we had a very fast summary. I'm, um, you know, if, um, if you were to do a study of some of the history and the details, there's much more to it, but that that's a general summary that helps us understand those distinctions. And um, it also helps us see ourselves because one of the things we do at Praise and Worship is we ask this question constantly. What does it mean to be Lutheran in the 21st century in America? That's kind of what I love to ask the question. And so if we're reading the Augsburg Confession, which again, as a church, we don't always read it together, although I quote from it pretty frequently. Um, you know, we'll, we'll use different writings in there because they're helpful. Um, if, we, if we're using that and, and the question then becomes, how would that apply to a real situation right here, right now? And, you know, one of those areas was the, the big area we had to navigate is as a congregation and as a church body, how do we do church online? How does that, what does that look like? And so early on, we had a lot of discussions in March and April about that. And it stretched on into May and June. Um, and I don't know that we did a really good job with that um, just as a body, but I think our congregation, um, we tried to navigate that in love. And that's always our thing. We're going to default to love. When in doubt, we're going to love our neighbors, which means we might do things in our congregation that are like, you know, we think we have freedom in that, or we think we have opportunity to do lots of different things. But the others in our group say that would hurt us. Well, then we're not going to do it because we don't want to hurt anyone. We want to love our neighbors. And that means submitting to them out of reverence for Jesus in Ephesians 5. So, yeah, good question. Any other questions? Those are, that's a really good one. All right, so um, what I would say is if you guys are interested and you ever wanted to dig deeper on the topic of Lutheran, um, I've shared with Gary a copy of the Book of Concord. I have others here in this building. And so if that's ever something you want to study more of, let me know. I actually do think that once the pandemic is over and we can sort of sit in a circle and do some deep dives, I, I thought we could do like the third Thursday of every month or something. We could do a study of the Book of Concord very slowly and gently and not not go too deep with it because it can oh, well overwhelm you a little bit but i think that would be something fun to do to really because what you learn what it ultimately is is a story you're learning this history and it's 
fascinating to see all kinds of different people, not just Lutherans, but Baptists and, and Methodists and Presbyterians with the origin story of all of those different groups. And you find out that really what they are is what, they, what we said they are. They're people. They're trying to do their best and given a crazy world. And based on what they feel and believe in their heart, you know, they're just doing their best. And so it's an honorable thing to learn where everybody's coming from. So it's really good. Yeah. Well, cool, guys. In that case, since we're a little over time, we'll draw this to a close. And let's have a quick prayer. And then we can uh, enjoy the rest of our evening. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you have seen fit to make, their, make a place called Praise and Worship Lutheran Church. We also rejoice that you have seen fit to give us the freedom to be able to just say, hey, come to praise and worship. We're, we're a Christ-centered, disciple-making community. So that someone who knows none of this history, knows none of this background, can still be brought to the feet of Jesus right away. And we know that can be done in every church anytime. But in our context, this is the way we have been called to do it. And we pray that you would bless that effort. Help us be faithful. Help us never... Um, in an effort to keep things clear and understandable, let us never detach from that which grounds us and roots us. Most importantly, we're rooted and centered in you um, through your word. And then we believe, teach, and confess um, that the Book of Concord is indeed a faithful exposition of your word. And we pray all of this, Jesus, in your mighty name, that you would keep us on track with all of these things. Amen. All right, guys, thank you so much and have a great evening. And we will do this again, same time, same channel next, next Sunday night. Thank you, Mark. Good night. Right. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. 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 For more information and for more audio and video content, visit www.branson.church.